Hi, I'm Jonathan Burke, Professor of Finance at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. And I'm Jules van Binsbergen, a finance professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. And this is the All Else Equal podcast. All right, welcome back, everybody. Today, we're going to talk about keeping your options open, or what in finance we call real options. And maybe to illustrate what we're going to talk about today, it's good to start with a very simple example. Okay, so let's make a simple assumption, as we always do on this show, in order to explain something, we simplify the problem. And so let's imagine making an investment decision, and let's first think about a take-it-or-leave-it decision. So you're going to invest in some project or some investment, but you either invest now, and if you don't invest, it disappears. And so the standard tool that we use in finance to make decisions like this is what we call the net present value investment criterion. And this criterion is, I think, Jonathan, unbelievably intuitive. The way it just works is this. Every decision you make has upsides and downsides, or what in economics we call benefits and costs. You take the net of those two things, but of course, generally the costs and the benefits don't happen at the same time. So we have to take that into account that generally the benefits come later and the costs come first. And so we use a tool in finance called discounting to take care of that. Once I've taken care of all of that, I nicely trade off the benefits against the costs. And a good decision just means in net present value terms, the benefits are bigger than the costs. Now, how much more intuitive does it get than that? Exactly. When I teach this, Jules, I say, The net present value rule answers the question, how much money will I make if I undertake this investment decision? And if the answer is you're going to make money, in other words, if the net present value is positive, you should take the decision. And if the answer is you're going to lose money or the net present value is negative, you shouldn't do the decision. And that is the simple rule that everybody should use to make investment decisions. Now, the next step, which is the question, we made the assumption that you have a take it or leave it offer. And under the take it or leave it situation, the MPV rule gives us a clear answer to either go or not go. But the take it or leave it assumption is a pretty strong assumption. Exactly. And so really what this podcast episode is about is what happens if we relax that assumption? What if you could choose not to take the project but later on take the project. In other words, you have an option to delay the investment decision. And to see why this is important, let's just consider a really simple example. So imagine today we have a project that is a tiny positive NPV. Let's say if you undertake the project, the net present value of the project, that the benefits minus the costs equal exactly one set. And if it's a take it or leave it project, We should take it. I mean, one set is better than zero. But let's now imagine we could delay this project until tomorrow. And tomorrow we're going to get some news and we'll learn that either the project will be worth $100 million or be worth minus $100 million. What should we do? Well, I think you can see there it's optimal to delay because if we wait till tomorrow, then we don't have to take the project when it's minus 100. So basically, we're indifferent. It's either if we don't care about a cent, today we make a cent. If it turns out to be minus $100 million, we make nothing. The amount we lose is almost inconsequential. However, if the project turns out to be worth $100 million, we just made $100 million. And so obviously, the correct thing to do now is, even though the project has positive NPV of one cent, We should not undertake it. We should wait till tomorrow and then make the decision. Yeah, and so the example that makes it very, very clear that indeed there can be a a huge value to waiting, but the example had two aspects to it that we need to discuss. The first aspect is we assumed that there was no cost to delaying the project. That's assumption one. And secondly, what you introduced quite nicely, Jonathan, in that example is that you introduced a humongous value of the information that came out. Because obviously, if between now and tomorrow, we could truly find out whether this project is plus 100 million or minus 100 million, that's quite a lot of information that we've just learned. And so in reality, of course, neither of these two are this strong, but the effects are still there. But by waiting, 
I am going to learn more information about the project. I can make a better decision with that better information, but there's also going to be some cost to delaying the decision. If there's no cost to delay, then you should never take the project today. You should always wait because more information will always let you make a better decision. So go back to that example, plus 100 million, minus 100 million. Even if to take the project today was worth $50 million to us, if there's no cost to delay, we should wait and see what happens, right? Avoid the minus $100 million case. So the question is, what if there is a cost to delay? And that's the fundamental trade-off. In deciding whether you're going to take the project, you have to trade off the cost of delaying against what you learn in the interim. And so if the cost of delaying is high, which means you're going to miss out on some very large cash flows, then the commensurate NPV of the project will be very high. And that's the fundamental trade-off in deciding whether you should delay the investment decision or whether you should take the investment decision. And the insight is, given any cost, there's going to be a positive NPV at which point you're going to say, the amount I give up today is too large, so I'm going to take the project. So the correct decision rule, once you can delay, is the NPV has to be high enough, given the costs, to take the project. Yes, although... In the trade-off you just introduced, Jonathan, there was already that other piece, which is the following. If between now and the future decision point, I don't learn anything new, and there is no new information revealed, then what's the point of waiting? And so then for any cost that is going to be associated with waiting, I would much rather take the investment decision today. And so here we nicely get that trade-off between how much does it cost to delay versus what's the value of what I learn. And so now, of course, a key question we're going to get to this later is, can I somehow put a value on that? Because it seems pretty illusory to try to nail this concept, right? I mean, if you have a discussion with someone and you say, well, should you really take a decision now or should you wait? Maybe you learn something new. They're going to say, yeah, but how can I quantify the value of what I learned? I think that's absolutely correct. And that's where modern finance does have something to say. It's not a simple problem to think about. But... The way you want to think about it is it's an option to delay. If there's a take it or leave it project, you don't have the option to delay. If it's not a take it or leave it project, you do have the option to delay, and that option is worth something. And in financial economics, where there's a lot of research and a lot of development on how to value options, and we can use that to bring structure to this problem. Indeed. And so some of the problems that we can look at are what we call options to expand, options to delay, and even options to abandon. And let's just make, again, a very simple example. Suppose that you're thinking about launching a new product, and launching the new product comes with a very large investment. Now, the uncertainty that you face is, will the project be successful in the market? Now. You can choose to immediately jump into the deep end of the pool, or you can decide to first tip your toe in the pool and find out what the temperature is like. So what would that be like in this example? Well, maybe you should first do a beta version of the project or do a pilot project for the product that you're trying to launch. And therefore, maybe in one city, try out how the product does. What's the advantage? Well, you don't invest a big amount immediately. You first invest a tiny little bit just to learn how the product will do in that particular market. Then you find out whether it succeeds in that small market setting. And then as long as that teaches you something about the big market, you can then decide whether or not you should launch nationally, yes or no. And so by running the pilot project first, I haven't jumped into the deep end of the pool with a very large investment. I've postponed my investment to a later date, my large investment. I just spend a little bit of money now, learn a lot of information about how this product is going to do. And then later on, I can always decide to launch big or not. So, you know, let me expand on this because I think it's a really nice example. Imagine you have a product and for whatever reason, you are almost certain it's going to succeed, right? Well, in that case, 
the cost to delay is actually very high. Because if you're almost certain of going to succeed, doing the pilot project means you're missing out on the gigantic cash flows you're going to get if the project succeeds worldwide. And so there's an example where the costs are high, so you don't want to delay. You want to do the whole thing. That's not a very common case. The most common case is you don't have a lot of information about how the product is going to do. So in that case, since there's a large chance, what does it mean? I don't know how the project is going to do. It means there's a large probability the project is going to fail. In other words, there isn't a very large certain cash flow coming in. So in that sense, the costs are not that large. And so then you want to dip your toe in the water because you're not giving up a lot. And instead, you're learning a tremendous amount about the future cash flows. So the value of the information is high. So that's the case where you delay, right? And so this example you've just given is a wonderful example of the trade-off between the information you're going to learn and the, what you're missing, the cost of the delay. Yes, for sure. And so maybe we can expand a little more on the different types of costs that you can incur, because I think they can be split up in a bunch of different categories. I think one of them is a key one that you just mentioned, which is if you launch globally or nationally later, you miss out on the big cash flows you could already be earning. That's one, right? So that's one thing that you're missing out on. Secondly, you may be in a competitive situation where you taking too much time gives your competitors a competitive advantage and you are behind if you first mess around too long and therefore you're not going full in. So there's a competitive pressure argument there that I think is important. Yeah. As well as you could think of that in the extreme as a take it or leave it, right? You could think about that situation where if you don't move now, your competitors get an advantage, you can never come back. In the extreme case, that's a take it or leave it. And so that's why you can move from one extreme to the other. For sure. And then the third one, and I think this one is a tougher one, Jonathan, I don't know what your thoughts are on this one, but I often ask the executives also in my executive education courses, how they are perceived if too often they say, I'd rather not make a decision right now. Why don't we just postpone? Why don't we just postpone? And every time they postpone, because they're doing it for a good reason, because they're learning this new information. But they are not exactly coming across as decisive leaders or as people that know what they're doing. So what would you say to that? Well, that's a tough one, Joel, because it could be the case that it's optimal to delay. And the person actually being very decisive. He's making a decision to delay. But of course, we know there are many, many people who can't make decisions, right? And so when they delay the decision, it's actually a behavioral problem and they can't make a decision. And for a manager, they have to differentiate that too. And one of the big problems with real options is that there are these moral hazard issues, right? We'll talk about more of them in a bit, but from an upper level manager trying to figure out why somebody's choosing to delay, I think that that's a legitimate thing to worry about. And so maybe one way to at least get out of the bit is to just set very clear hurdles and say, if we learn this in a pilot project, I'm committing to if the pilot project comes out successful, we will launch. Maybe in that way, you can still postpone and still come across as decisive, but it's still, in practice, it's a challenge. Okay, Jules, I think we've given a lot of intuitive reasons and explained intuitively why the real option to delay is a very important option. But I think many of our listeners are worried, okay, a lot of intuition here, but how do I practically use this? Yes, for sure. And so can we put some hard numbers on this? Because we can theorize about it, but can I just put dollar numbers on this value of information and on this value to delay? And I think one of the big advantages is that the field of financial options has made such progress in providing tools to value financial options that as long as we can translate the financial options to what we call the real options, to real investment decisions, then we actually have made a big jump. And one of the nice things I think is that we can make such a translation. And the reason for that is the following. If we think about what a call option is, a call option is when you buy the right to purchase the stock at a future date at a given price. So you can think of this a little bit as, I am simply not making the big stock purchase decision today, but rather I pay a little bit of money now so that I have the right to make the decision later. And I can still back off later. I cannot exercise the option as it's called, or I can jump in at that point in time. 
But between now and then, I am going to learn more information. And the more information in this case that I'm learning is I can see what the market price of the stock is going to do between now and then. And so you can see that all the aspects that we just discussed, which is that there's some value lost to delaying. There's some price you need to pay. You may lose out on some cash flows, dividends in this case. But it also has this thing that information comes out between now and when I exercise the option. And so therefore, I can make a better decision later because of this extra information. And Jules, I agree. I mean, the field of option pricing is an enormous field in finance. I would say this, you have to be careful. Let me give you an example of a case where I'm not saying you can't apply the tools of financial options, but you have to be careful. So let me give you an example. Take an employee who has a stock option, right? Let's compare that to a regular person who has a stock option. Generally, as finance professors, for a non-dividend paying stock, we would say you never exercise your option to buy a stock early. And the reason is because the option is always valuable. And so the option itself, you can sell for a higher price in the market. This is actually an application of the same concept we saw before. If the stock is not paying a dividend, then there's no cost to waiting. And so you should never exercise your option early, which is why the option sells for a higher price than the immediate exercise value. The problem with an employee stock option is it's not tradable. So that argument doesn't go through. And so an employee might choose to exercise their stock option early. Uh, obvious reason is an employee may be very undiversified. They may have too much wealth tied up in the stock options. And so since they can't sell the option, the only way to diversify is to exercise the option, get hold of the stock, and then sell the stock. And so the employee stock option is not as valuable to the employee as it would be if it was a tradable option. And if we use the formula that prices tradable options to price employee stock options, you would get a value that was too high. So here's an example where you don't want to keep your options open because Closing off the option allows you to get the stocks, sell them in the market, and get a better diversified alternative. But Jonathan, if I think about real investment decisions inside of firms, particularly publicly traded firms, we can agree that this diversification argument isn't an issue. Now, could it possibly be an issue in real options for, say, a privately owned firm where the owner is not very diversified? Could that translate or not? Well, I would say there are other reasons why the fact that a real option isn't tradable, why you can't necessarily apply standard financial techniques. The standard financial technique for valuing an option relies heavily on the option being tradable. But that doesn't mean we can't still consider the case when the option isn't tradable. And then the field of real options really is a field about adjusting those techniques for the case when the option isn't tradable. And there's going to be some cases where you don't need much adjustment. And there are going to be other cases where you're going to have to be a big adjustment. But at least you have a starting point to evaluate the decision with the option to delay. Yes, for sure. So now, as the last thing that we should discuss, let's think a little bit about these moral hazard problems and in introducing options. Let me give you an example. So whenever we make investment decisions inside a firm, the fact that we're going for a particular project will always open up possibilities and options for future things to happen. And so sometimes we call these things growth options, meaning if I now launch a product or do something, I'm undoubtedly going to get new ideas, maybe even ideas that I didn't even expect to get along the path. And so the question now is, when people are trying to convince you to go for an investment project and they say, well, listen, the project itself as a take it or leave it isn't positive MPV. But if I take into account all of these other extra pieces and the growth options and all the possibilities that it might deliver in the future, this is definitely something that we should do. And I do think that this is a bit tricky because, you know, how convincing is it going to be when people need all of these growth options to make to positive MPV? And doesn't that open up the possibility for people to come up with all kinds of stuff? People always want their project to be executed because you know we have empire building and all kinds of other problems that people have inside of firms. 
And so shouldn't we be concerned that they will use these option arguments to try to make things that really are bad investment decisions look much better than they really are? Jules, I agree with you, but I think there are two problems that occur. One is a tendency to ignore all gas options, which is clearly a mistake. Another tendency to invent growth options to make the project look good. And so in this case, I think it's very important to bring a lot of discipline to the problem. And I mean, it's not that hard to bring some discipline. For example, imagine a drug company. It's well known that drugs get developed and then are used for other purposes. Rogaine, I think it's Rogaine, the drug that allows you to grow hair, was developed for a completely different purpose. Viagra was developed for a completely different purpose. So it's well known in the drug industry that when you develop a drug, there might be applications of the drug that you don't know about. So that's a growth option. Now, the question is, how can you value that? One thing a drug company can do is look at the historical record of drugs and estimate, look, how valuable has this growth option been for us in the past? And at least use that as the beginning of, okay, well, how much more value to this development does the growth option add? And then sophisticated drug companies can probably figure out that in some areas are more likely to lead to other growth options and other areas are less likely to lead to other growth, to other options. I think that there should be some effort made to formally think about these growth options. I mean, venture capitalists do this all the time. When they look at a startup, essentially startups are really just a collection of growth options. And you don't really know where the startup is going to go because that's an extreme example of putting your toe in the water. You know, you've got an idea how this is going to work. You put your toy in the water, you find it doesn't work. But two years before something else worked, and you pivot. The word pivot is like a common word used throughout the startup industry. And that is a lot of growth options. Interestingly enough, I don't think people do a lot of formal analysis of that. Also there, I think that the key ingredients are so obvious, right? The first one is options are most valuable when the uncertainty is the largest. One. Two. The only way to benefit from these options, if you have the flexibility and you capture options open and you're willing to pivot if you need to. So if you already put everything in stone and you're not flexible to adjust to the new information environment that you have, you cannot exercise these options in the right way, right? And so I think that highly uncertain environments, and I think that the venture capital world is one of the best examples where it's very difficult to come up with valuations. And so often my students say, well, if it's so uncertain, doesn't even make sense to do any valuation or any MPV calculations at all. And I always say, well, it's exactly the opposite. The only reason why finance is so interesting and why so much money can be made in these places is because given the amount of uncertainty, knowing how to deal with it and knowing how to optimally use the revelation of information and the ability to pivot to generate value, should be seen as an opportunity, not as a threat. Jules, I think maybe our listeners, some of them might not be familiar with this concept that you just stated, which is the more uncertain the decision is, the more valuable the growth option. The intuition for that, if there's a lot of uncertainty, it means there's a lot of information that could come out to let you make a better decision. And so therefore, you want to delay to get to that information. And so... That's the essence of the argument that in high uncertain environments, you would spend more effort thinking carefully about the growth options and how valuable they are and whether the investment is worth it. For sure. And then the final insight, I think, is that people should not view the paths that are followed as set in stone in the sense that when we talked about the pilot project, right, this is really something that you yourself can introduce. You can create your own options by being flexible and by spacing out and scaling at the right level at the right time. And so I think that isn't, should be an important part of investment planning as well. well okay, Jules, I think uh, this has been a nice introduction of the ideas of real options and the option to delay. I mean, obviously, in a half an hour, there's a limit to how detailed you could get. But I think hopefully our listeners get some sense of the importance of thinking about these issues. 
Yeah, and the ability to create value through them. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the All Else Equal podcast. Please leave us a review at Apple Podcast. We'd love to hear from our listeners. And be sure to catch our next episode by subscribing or following our show wherever you listen to your podcast. For more information and episodes, visit allelseequalpodcast.com or follow us on LinkedIn. The All Else Equal podcast is a production of Stanford University's Graduate School of Business and is produced by University FM.